Amen. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate you guys. Welcome, church. Excited to be here. Hey, listen, my name is John. I'm one of the pastors here. As you probably have recognized, uh, you very uh, attentive, detail-oriented individuals, we are not in our office space where we normally film. We are actually at Calvary Plantation. Listen, if you're like, why didn't I get an invite? It's because right now it's just the staff and the production team, but I am excited to announce that soon and very soon, to use Malik's language, we will be regathering in person for our macro gathering here at Calvary Chapel Plantation. Come on, somebody. All the extroverts said, thank you, Jesus, all right? Um, listen, we're going to take the next few weeks to establish our social distancing protocols, to make sure that our sanitation protocols are on point. We're going to get everything squared away. we got to figure out all the tech involved in this, um, but I am very excited. Some of you are like, man, I, I, we're going to be meeting in person with an option in the coming weeks on Saturday mornings at Calvary Plantation. If you're like, uh, maybe you're immunocompromised or you're like, I'm not ready to come back yet, no sweat. We totally get it. We will continue to have service on on Sunday mornings online as well. So more coming about that, but I'm very excited. Uh, it is Sukkot, and so any, for any of you like me from a Jewish background who celebrate the feast, Hag Sameach. Matter of fact, why don't you try saying that with me? Hag Sameach. If you're not spitting on your dog, you're doing it wrong, all right? Uh, this means happy holidays. It's a feast of tabernacles. My, my wife, my family, we celebrated with my mom in our sukkah last night. Y'all know I'm not a handyman, so thank you to the Sauls who built that thing it was awesome. Uh, we are in the midst of a series called For Such a Time as This, going through the book of... There we go. Production team at least knows. Hopefully you know it as well. Going through the book of Esther, dialoguing on, of the, on the fact that in the midst of a crazy time like this one, where it is so tempting to feel as if things are utterly random, God is not scrambling in heaven. In fact, he is seated on the throne, and you and I have been uniquely called in this season for such a time as this. Last week, Greg, our college outreach director, who you just heard from, did a fantastic job. Did you guys enjoy that? Fantastic job reminding us that God is writing our story, calling us to a place of trust where we let go of the pen and allow him to be the author. If you missed it, you can catch up on our podcast or our YouTube channel. This week, I want to talk about, in light of God's goodness and his sovereignty, how we deal with one another. Now, just to catch us all up to speed, we've been introduced to several characters in this story in the book of Esther up to this point. We've got King Xerxes. He is a bad man in every shape and form. He is a very poor ruler. He is very emotionally immature, and he is just not an overall great guy. Esther and Mordecai, on the other hand, are the human heroes of the story. They are Jewish individuals living in exile, not exactly bastions of faith to begin with, but they begin to awaken in their faith as things get desperate. Namely because we have an arch villain in the story. His name is what? Haman. Boo! There we go. Production team remembered. You're like, why are they booing? Because he's horrible. Also, it's what we do in Jewish tradition on the celebration of Purim, and I just like it. So we're introduced to Haman. Boo! Who decides that when slighted by Mordecai, Haman kind of expects everyone to functionally bow down and honor him. Mordecai doesn't do it. Haman, motivated by hatred from hell itself, decides, I'm not just going to take it out of Mordecai. I'm going to commit genocide and kill the entirety of the Jewish people. Because hate is from hell. And so that's what he decides to do. And so last week, when we last left our heroes, we were introduced to Haman, boo, who constructs a 75-foot gallows to hang Mordecai. He's going to make it this big public spectacle. In fact, he, he comes into the king all excited to, to have this moment, and, and he gets cut off, and the king says, what should I do for a man that the king loves to honor? And Haman, boo, is like, who else would the king want to honor but me? Because narcissists will narcissize. Is that a word? I don't know. I'm going to go with it. And so he decides, you should do all these great things. And the king says, man, that's so good, Haman. Do that for Mordecai. And in bitter irony, the very one that he endeavored to kill, he ends up honoring. He gets home, his wife is like, this is not good, babe. This is not going to end well. And this is where our story picks up, chapter 7. He is summoned to a second banquet with Esther and King Xerxes. Did you catch all that? It's like drinking from a fire hose. Catch back up on the YouTube channel and then come back to us if you need to. Stand to your feet wherever you're at as we get ready to read and honor God's word together. If you're ready, say, let's do this. Type in the chat, let's do this. Here we go. Chapter 7, I'll begin in verse 1. So the king and Haman boo, went in to the feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, okay, Queen Esther, 
What is your request? It shall be granted to you. Even to half the kingdom it shall be filled. Then Queen Esther answered, you're like, please, please, God, let her finally tell him. If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, okay, okay, get to it. Let my life be granted me. You're like, thank God. Let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold. I and my people to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent. I don't know about all that. Uh, For our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he? Who has dared to do this? And Esther said, a foe and an enemy, this wicked Haman. Boo, can you imagine the scene so gratifying, that moment in the movie where the bad guy gets what's coming to him? She says, it's Haman, a foe and an enemy. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. King and the queen, the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. You know it took a lot for Xerxes to get away from his wine drinking, but there he goes. Haman stays behind to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. The king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine just as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the queen was like, oh, heaven, nah. Are you going to assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? And as the word left his mouth, they cover Haman's face. Then Harbona, I love this, one of the eunuchs came into the attendance of the king and said, you know, Haman made this gallows to hang Mordecai. You kind of get the sense that nobody liked Haman right? Nobody. He's like, you know, I, I, Haman made this gallows to hang Mordecai, who, whose words saved the king. He, she's laying it on thick there, and it's standing in Haman's house 50 cubits high, 75 feet high, and the king said, you know what? Hang him on that. Ooh, this will preach right there. So they hanged Haman on the very same gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Would you join me as we pray? Jesus, help us out. Give us grace and let the dolphins continue on their winning trajectory for the glory of God and the mercy of his servants in South Florida. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. You can be seated. You're like, why did you just pray for football? Why not pray for football? The dolphins need all the prayers they can get. You ever prejudged someone and been totally embarrassingly wrong? Anybody there? Show, show of hands if you're out there. Right, don't judge me right now. Now you're just as guilty as I was. Um, I, I, I got to be honest with you. I've got a confession to make. I have a hard time with like Christian celebrities and, and TV preachers. Um, you, you, you see stuff on the news and, and big fancy this and big fancy that. And, and I just have a hard time with it. And um, one of the ironies of this season is due to COVID, I became overnight a TV preacher of sorts. And now you've all had been stuck with me on your television for the last seven months, right? Um, but but I, I just have a hard time with it. And so in, in what feels like another life at this point, I used to do music stuff. And so I ended up working for a charity foundation in Canada. And somehow I ended up TV doing a song. I ended up on TV doing a song. And so it was like a Christian TV program. And uh, as as I got in there, they're like, oh, we have this like Christian celebrity that's also going to be sharing. You're going to be like in a green room with them. And I went to all, I'm just being honest here. I went to all sorts of judgy judge judgment thoughts in my mind. Like I was like, oh my God, oh, this is going to be great. And and I had all these ideas based off of things I've read or things I've heard of what this person was going to be like and how things were going to go down. I'm expecting them to be real smug and and real diva-like and real whatever. And so I get in there. And I start interacting with them, and they were just great. So godly, so humble, so ja- I mean, they're like, hey, do you want, they gave me all this stuff. I don't need any of this. They were just, they were so overwhelmingly fantastic that I felt like an absolute dirtbag sitting there doing all of these pre-judgments. And I, I walked out of there, I'm like, man, that was a fail for my life. And I don't know, have you ever been there before? You ever prejudge someone? By the way, that's where we get the idea of prejudice from. You ever prejudge someone only to find out that you were actually the villain, not them? I, I, I think about this story and I think about this moment and, and, and I'm deeply impassioned in my heart because we live in this moment with why this sermon matters so deeply because we live right now in this moment, moment in an incredibly harsh and judgmental culture. Can anybody say presidential debate? I'm going to leave that one there. We live in this harsh, harsh culture. I mean, what is up with judging? It's so unique. It's so strange because on one hand, we sort of of hate being judged. Everybody hates being judged. If there's one Bible verse that everyone seems to know, even if they don't know any others, it's judge not. Man, judge not. You better not judge. 
We all seem to hate being judged, and yet simultaneously, we all do it. We all do it. We, we have this undeniable proclivity towards judgment. See, and this is problematic because we already know this about ourselves as human beings. We are very inaccurate judges. We're very inaccurate. Psychology calls this the, the self-serving bias. Basically what this means is you could look at two different people doing the exact same thing and judge one of them significantly more harshly. Which one is that? The one that's not you. You look at someone and they're eating unhealthy and you're like, oh my goodness, don't they know? Their body is a temple of the Lord. How dare they defile his temple? And, you, and then you go off on a sugar binge. You're like, man, God understands. I just had a hard day at work. You know how God understands. You know how it is. We have this interesting dichotomy in our brains. And, and I think there's a warning in the passage because this is not simply a true story that happened way back then. This is a true account of humanity and we have not changed much. See, Haman, we see it in the text, he wants to be judge and jury of Mordecai. And if you and I are not careful, so do we. See, it's not simply a judgmental culture. We live in the midst of a merciless culture as well. We are not just judgmental. We are merciless in our judgments. We'll call each other names. We'll say horrible things about one another's families. We'll celebrate when someone else gets sick or, God forbid, even if they die. And it's not just a political problem, and it's not uniquely an American cultural problem. This is a problem with humanity. And I think that Jesus, in this moment, using the text from Esther 7, wants to speak into this moment culturally with a powerful reminder as we continue our study through Esther. I've got one big idea, one core thought for the morning, and my thought is this. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Matter of fact, why don't you say it wherever you're watching from right now. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Preach it to your cat if you need to because the Lord knows they need to get saved. With the measure you use, it will be measured. All the cat people are like, it's only the grace of God that keeps me here at this church. Thank you so much. <laughs> with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. You're like, oh yeah, I, I don't know if I agree with that, pastor. I don't know if I think that's exactly accurate. Oh yeah, says who? says Jesus. <laughs> Argue with him. Matthew 7, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. Check this out. And with the measure you use, you're like, snap, it's a Bible verse. It's a Bible verse. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. See, we, we live right now in the age of crazy. Trump supporters, crazy. People who support Joe Biden, man, they got to be crazy. If you're a Republican, I mean, Republicans, they're crazy. And, and liberals, they're crazy. And, if, man, if you're going to send your kids back to school in person right now, crazy. And if you're not going to send your kids back to school in person right now, are you kidding me? You got to be crazy. We live in an age where every single person is crazy except for you. We live in this unique age, and it's not simply an age of judgment. It is, if we're being honest and circumspect, it is also an age of double standards. Everyone wants to judge others by the harsh measure, but we want to be judged by the light measure, namely our intent. Intent. We want to judge protesters on their best moment, but judge police on their worst moment. We want to judge Trump on his best moment, but then we judge Biden on his worst moment. We want to come at others with how we took it. But then we want other people to extend to us mercy and grace by what we meant. And the word of warning from Esther this morning, I, I cannot have us miss this church. It is so vital in the midst of this moment. Here is the word of warning from the book of Esther. You will get hung by the gallows you prepare for other people. Come on, somebody. You, this is what we see. Haman, motivated by hatred, is like, I'm going to stick it to Mordecai. And he gets hung on the very gallows he is prepared. This is a theme, actually, all throughout the totality of Scripture. Proverbs 26 says it like this. If you set a trap for others, you're going to get caught in it yourself. If you roll a boulder down on others, apparently that's like a thing in the ancient world. I don't really know, but if you roll a boulder, that would be interesting. If you roll a boulder down on others, it will crush you instead. 
One of the reasons I love Jesus, I'm, I love the way of Jesus is because he is compassionate, he's merciful, he's patient, but he is deeply honest. And here's what God says. God says, listen, you can use whatever measure you want. You could, do, you could judge people as harshly as you want. You could come at people as strongly as you want. But friends, do not miss this. Judgment is a boomerang. And however you toss that thing, it is coming right back at you. Jesus says with the measure you use, whew, I, I'm trying, I'm, I want to throw this so bad. Will you catch it in the camera if I throw it right now? <laughs> Riding the production guy's like, please don't, I'll die. With the measure you use, I don't want someone throwing it back at me. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Judgment is like a boomerang. The warning, at least initially, is to the little Haman in all of us. Because let's be honest, we all got a little bit of Haman in us. Stop trying to execute people on the gallows in your life. Beware. You say, all right, pastor, but... but you got to understand something. What they did, what they said, how they acted, how they interacted, it's not okay. Do you, I was wronged. That deserves judgment. And you might be entirely right. What I'm not saying is, is that everything is okay. What I'm, what I'm not saying is, man, come on, it's no biggie. Just, just move on. Just forget it. Don't be petty. What I'm saying is there are real consequences for real injustices but you need to understand something in the story and you need to understand something in our story. See, the same reality from this story in Esther 7 is powerfully true in our story as well. Namely, the great revealing is coming. Type it right there in the chat. The great revealing is coming. I love that image. That's awesome. The great revealing is coming. See, there's been a lot of concealing in this story up to this point. Very wicked motives and wicked actions that seem to have gone unpunished and even worse, been rewarded up to this point. But do not miss this, friends. The judge is on the throne and nothing slips past his gaze. Luke 8 says it like this. Jesus is speaking to his disciples then, just like he's speaking to his disciples right now. He says, for there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Jesus says, listen, one day, everything is going to be revealed. Live in such a way where that revealing will be a blessing, not a curse. Friend, I need to remind you of something. God is not slack. God is not negligent. God is patient and merciful. But friend, no one is getting away with anything which in part is great news, <sighs> sigh of relief, okay, good, justice is going to happen, God's going to get them, and in part, if we're being honest, is spiritually terrifying, makes me want to pee my pants spiritually a little bit, because I'm like, no one's getting what God knows, everything, skeletons in my closet, issues and drama that I have, see, here, here's the problem, this moment has us deeply focused simply, if we're not careful, on the immediate, and, and I get it, everything is so raw, it's so visceral in this moment. Things are so emotional that it's got us in this space where it's very hard to zoom out and understandably so. Here's the problem, and I need to remind you of something. In this moment, you and I are actively becoming a certain type of person. Do you know who that person is? It's a moment for deep introspection. It's a moment for honest, divinely guided self-awareness. See, I need you to realize something right now. Right now, you are being discipled. Your consistent and persistent words and thoughts and actions and thought patterns are actually morphing your habits in both thought and deed. And this moment is eventually going to pass. Things will change. Things will morph. Culture runs cyclically. This moment will pass. Uh, laws will be enacted. Things will change. Some things won't. Some things will eventually. This moment will pass. But when it does, you will be someone. Make sure you know now who you're becoming. See, our mission here at the greenhouse is to help ordinary people become passionate followers of who? 
Jesus, which means Jesus is Lord. Jesus is a thought leader. Jesus is master. Jesus is rabbi. And Jesus has a very distinct way and path laid out in scripture when it comes to judging and judgment. Here's my application point for the sermon. I want us to follow Jesus and choose the generous measure. Choose the, you could type it right there. If you're taking notes, I would have you write that one down, highlight that, choose the generous measure. What do you mean by that? I mean, I mean with your thoughts, with your words, with your actions, with your judgments, with your social media posts. Hey, oh, just messed all up in the Kool-Aid jar there. Choose the generous measure. There's a lot on social media right now about righteous anger. And I think rightfully so. I think there are, there are a lot, there's enough happening in culture right now to be righteously angry about. The, the, the concern in my heart is not about righteous anger. The concern in my heart right now on a pastoral level is what do we do with righteous anger? And I think we all need to be a little bit more honest. It is entirely possible to respond to righteous anger in very unrighteous ways. And it's a call back to the scriptures. It's a call back to the way of Jesus. And, and I need to remind us, disciples of Jesus, we serve a different king. And our king Jesus calls us to respond differently than the lowercase k king Xerxes of this world. And it offends the left and it offends the right. And it challenges one side. It challenges Jesus. I love it because he is an equal opportunity offender. Listen to what he says. Here's how Jesus rolls. He says, listen, in Proverbs 15, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Romans 2 says, so when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience? Check this out. This is key. Not realizing that it is God's what? Kindness that leads us to repentance. It is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. I need to understand in this moment, you are actively being discipled by voices. Some of them are the voice of God and Jesus and the scriptures, and lots of them are not. And followers of Jesus, we need to get clear and honest about something if you follow Jesus. And maybe you don't and you're investigating God, faith, and spirituality. Man, we're thrilled you're here. You can listen in and be like, whoa, this is a different way of doing life. It is. It's actually better. See, the world is, is using terms right now. They're, they're using Bible terms like justice, but, but Jesus sets the definition for terms. And, and while our world is using terms, they actually mean something very different. See, right now, we are living in the midst of what is being called a justice revolution. But by and large, I'm concerned because so much of this is not justice. It's actually what the Bible calls vengeance. See, these are, these are two different things. You say, John, what, what do you mean? How do you go there? I'll, I'll tell you, you can see the heart posture being reflected in the words and thoughts of what happens after. This is on both sides, by the way. This is, this is left and right. This is politically both camps. This is people all across the board. You, you'll watch it like this on, on one side of things. You'll get a police officer that's killed at a protest. And people say things like, well, I mean, you know, they chose that occupation. You know, it's, it's collateral damage. And then on the other side, you'll, you'll have an unarmed black man or an unarmed black female that gets killed. And people will say, well, I mean, you, you know, they shouldn't have been resisting. I mean, we don't know all the details. We don't know all the facts. And the problem with that, friends, is if you follow Jesus on either side, you are dealing with a human being made in the image of God. Scripture tells us, listen, we don't justify acts of wickedness. No matter which side of the camp you tend to align socially or politically. See, we live in the midst of what is being called justice, but if we're really getting down to the heart motivation, it's actually not justice as God defines it. It's actually vengeance, and here's the problem. Vengeance is not in our job description. That's what he does. Romans 12, 19 says it like this. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay you're like, what are you saying? Here's what I'm saying. Biblically, the vision for justice, if you want to use God's terms, and by the way, he invented it, so I think we do. Vision for justice, biblically, is a justice that leads to peacemaking. To be clear, let's get all on the same page. Jesus followers, if that's you, the message of the gospel is we were enemies of God. 
We deserved judgment and God extended to us what? Mercy. And the heart of the father, we see it all throughout scripture in dealing with wickedness and wicked people is he is calling them, hoping for, longing for them to repent. The vision for God when it comes to justice is always redemption and reconciliation. And this is a problem for us because the, the, the problem from unchecked heart judgment from human sources is that human beings are deeply flawed. I need to be clear. This does not mean that we don't make value judgments. Obviously, we do that. This does not mean that we don't vote. This does not mean that we don't pray and then work towards his kingdom come, his justice be done on earth as it is in heaven. What it means is that we do that with a deep and honest degree of humility. In Matthew 7, we read a little bit of it. Jesus goes on and he basically lays out a principle. Here's his principle. My plank first. Jesus says, listen, if there's issues going on, you've got a brother that's in a tough spot. He, he doesn't say, just, just, just bat, don't bat an eyelid, just leave it alone. He says, deal with the plank in yours first and then respond. What's he pointing to? He's pointing to humility. Here's my prayer this week, Greenhouse, and, and I get it, man. This is where Jesus is like, he's going to offend everybody, but he's, he's calling us to real life. This week, I am praying that we as a church body that we would tear down the crosses we have it constructed to crucify people on. Because it's not our job. You're like, why are you talking about crosses? There's, a, there's an interesting historical insight in the passage. If you've been a follower of Jesus, you've been to church, you, you know about Jesus. He was crucified by a people group called the Romans in history. The Romans, while they perfected the cross, didn't actually invent the cross. In fact, we know that in history, the cross as a persecution and a torture tactic was invented by, guess who? The Persians. What Haman is constructing, we, we, it, it's called gallows. Other versions say a plank. What, his, what Bible scholars and historians tell us is that Haman constructed a 75-foot cross. And I think it's amazing how much we as human beings, if we're not careful, love to build crosses to crucify people on. When we couldn't handle that ourselves. John, are you saying not to pursue God's justice? Heaven no. I hope you've been tracking with us for any amount of this series. We pursue God's justice on earth as it is in heaven. We condemn evil, wicked things like white supremacy, which is straight from hell. All right, we go actively and directly against the injustice that scripture calls evil. What I'm calling us to greenhouse, what I'm calling to disciples of Jesus is that we pursue God's justice in God's ways with God's heart. And he's always hoping for repentance. He's always longing for reconciliation. He's always praying that, the, I mean, you see it in Ezekiel. It says, God's not slow, as some consider slow. He's patient, not wanting any to perish, but all to turn in repentance. It's, it, this is so, so, so powerful it's in such a big way on my heart because right now I look on Facebook, I look on social media, and I see gallows everywhere. If we're not careful, church, we have moved from being a community of people who preach grace to those far off, and we have begun to be a community that mirrors the world and that we don't preach grace anymore. Now we preach gallows. If you don't have it right, you're dead. And I need to remind us, church, Haman is not the hero of this story. Jesus is the savior of our souls. Church, we got to tear down our gallows. Why? Because with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. See, here's my concern. Our, our vision, our dream as a church is we long to be a place where people can belong before they believe and believe before they behave. We long to be a hospital for the sinners, for the broken, for those who don't have it all together. We long to be a supernaturally hospitable hospital. You remember that from the beginning of this pandemic feels like 16 years ago. All right, that is the vision. That's who we long to be. And yet my concern in this moment is where is a space for someone who does not have it all together right now? I think we need to be honest, church. Right now, you're in a conversation with someone. You're like, so what do you feel about politically? And people can feel it. Your gallows are set up waiting. Let's talk about racism for a moment. 
Biblically, it is a sin. Very clear in scripture. God's heart is for his family, every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. Every single human being, dignity, value, and worth because we're made in the image of God. Here's my question. Let's say someone was struggling with the sin of racism. Is there a place that they can go to receive grace and kindness from God as it leads them to repentance? You know what that place is supposed to be? Us. My concern right now, I mean, if we got some people that walk in the church all the time, they're battling with alcohol addiction, they're battling with pornography, and we realize with sin, here's what it's going to take. God's kindness is going to lead them to repentance, and it will be a messy process. They will blow it, they won't get it right all together, they'll make mistakes, they'll slip back, they'll have slip-ups, and we love them through it all. And my concern right now is if someone does not feel about the same way about you when it comes to race and matters of racially, even if what they feel is contrary to God's word because they're not there yet, Man, if they don't feel it immediately, it's gallows. Church, that's not who we are. This is not the way of our king. Do we call out sin and iniquity? Yes, we do. But we do it like God, with kindness and a longing for repentance. I was reminded this week of a story. I'll get ready to close it right here. I was reminded this week of a story. And it was one of the, one of the leaders in our church a few weeks after George Floyd was murdered. And she's a black female. And so we we're, were on a phone call and... I was just like, how, you know, how are you doing and what's going on and how can we love you and how can I be praying for you and I care about you and just lots of hard conversations in this season. She said, you know, thanks for, thanks for calling and we talked through a bunch of stuff and, and she said, you know what, I actually got to, I got to tell you this story. Um, it was the week after George Floyd was murdered and, and like most, most of our church family members of color She's like, I was distraught. I was, I mean, I, the last thing I wanted to do was to get around a bunch of people that didn't look like me. She said, because I, I, was, I was so hurt. I was feeling the pain in such visceral, raw ways. If I had to deal with one, well, actually, or, but we don't know all, if I had to deal with one of those, like, I would lose it. She's like, so I was just planning on skipping microchurch and and then one of the girls called me and she said, hey, I'll, I'll handle everything. I'll cover stuff for, you know, I'll, I'll jump in there and help. I just want you there. We love you. And she's like, oh, dang it. I can't even get out of this. Okay. She's like, so I went. And I made it through the discussion fine. And I made it through the songs fine. Right? It's all out here. Jesus is good and everything's great. And she's kind of, yeah, life sucks. But yeah, gee, you know, and you know those things are true, but it doesn't feel that way in the moment maybe. And she said, and then we got to that time where we broke out and, and they asked the question. How are you doing? She said, I got two words out and started weeping. And I'm sitting there crying, and, and this is when all of our microchurches were Zoom only. She said, I'm sitting there crying, and, and I'm dreading looking up at the screen to watch the faces of confusion, to watch the faces of what's going on. Why is this such a big deal? I don't even get it. To, to watch. She's like, I, I can't. This is the moment. I'm like, I know what it's going to be like. I know how this is going to be. I know how this is going to go down. I'm broken, I'm hurting, I'm wounded. They're just going to judge me. She said, and I looked up, John. And every single person on that screen is crying. She said, John, these are people, they don't look like me. They don't think like me. I know they don't all vote like me. Some of them I know don't even agree with the way I was thinking about things. She said, and they're all sitting there crying with me because they love me. Because we're family. That's what she said. She said, John, there is no place like the church. And friends, in the midst of a season where there are billions of dollars working to divide us, do you realize that? And in the midst of a season where there is every good reason in the natural to be su suspect of one another, to prejudge one another, to move into a place of harshness and harsh judgment, church, can we choose the generous measure because we're his church and where this world is building gallows to destroy people we are called by our king jesus to build bridges of grace to see redeemed people become a possibility and a reality church let's be who we are there's never been a moment of greater need than the one right now to be his church this is going to be a long sermon and i don't even care I was thinking this week about a story I heard forever ago. I'm like, man, this, this is why this matters so deeply. 
It was a young man, and, and he was breaking the law, and he knew it, and he got caught 50 miles per hour over the speed limit. No business even going that fast. He gets pulled into the courthouse, and the judge has a reputation for being just. They go through all the details, all the evidence, all the facts. This young man knows he is going to be pronounced guilty. And the fine is a hefty one that he cannot pay. And sure enough, the judge comes down and in his righteous, just judgment, slams a gavel and says, guilty. And levies out a fine that this young man cannot pay. And as he is dragged off to jail for the crime he rightfully committed, the judge says, hold on a second. And he gets down from his bench of righteous judgment and he removes his robe because what the watching world did not know is that this young man was not simply a plaintiff in a courtroom, but he was a family member of the judge. And this young man's father takes off his robe, pulls out his checkbook and writes the fine for the punishment that this young man rightfully deserves. And friends, I need to remind you, that is our story if you follow Jesus. You're like, what's up with the generous measure? How could I ever? Jesus is God's generous measure. Jesus is God's soft answer to turn away wrath. And his mercy triumphed over the judgment that you and I deserve. And God in his infinite mercy and kindness, he took off his royal robe and he came down to earth and he paid his debt, our debt with his very life. Friend, do you understand? Jesus was hung on those gallows. Jesus was hung on that pole so that all of us guilty Hamans did not have to be. It's the gospel. And when we've experienced his generous measure, it is the only thing that allows us to live generous measure with others. Let's pray. You can bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment of quiet and privacy between you and God. If, if you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I'm praying there's something in your heart that's beginning to be stirred right now. You're like, yeah, there is. That's God. He's real and he loves you. Scripture tells us that God always gives grace to the repentant, to those that are willing to turn in humility and say, I've been doing it my own way and I can't do it this way anymore. Jesus, help me. If you're here this morning, I wanna give you an opportunity to respond. If you're here this morning and you recognize that you stand guilty before God and you want to receive the generous measure of mercy and grace and forgiveness found only in Jesus. Friend, I hope you see that the way of Jesus is utterly unique from every way and every path and every religion and every talking head that's out there right now. If you know that Jesus is the thing you've been searching for, is the path you've been looking for, is the guide you've been longing for, and he is, here's what you do. You respond. Something as simple as God help me. Wherever you're at, you can just say those two words, God, help me. Jesus, your Lord. Jesus, your leader. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, teach me to live this life as you intended. Right now, there's a number on the body of your screen. You can text Jesus to that phone number right there. And, and one of our pastoral team members, one of our staff members would love to walk you through next steps in your faith journey. We would love to come alongside of you, sort of like a, a spiritual guide in your life, a spiritual mentor in your life to help you look at in your life, what does it mean to follow Jesus, to find a place of life and flourishing like God intended for you all along? Maybe you're here and you're already a follower of Jesus. You've already received the generous measure and this morning, what you want to do is, is you need to repent from harsh judgment and make a decision this morning to begin to give the generous measure to others. If that's you, wherever you're at, you can ask those three words, those same three words, God, help me. God, help me. Wherever you're at, you can look up at me right now. Listen, if you're, if you're looking for a place of grace, to be encouraged in your life, encouraged in your faith journey, to find a place like I shared, a place of belonging, a place of safety. Listen, church, the church, when it's working right, should be the safest place on the planet. 
because we were those that were broken and lost. And Jesus is having grace with us, which means we have grace with one another. If you're looking for a place like that, we would love to invite you in. We have them here called microchurches. Small groups of five to 25, they meet in person. Some, some of them meet with in-person options. Most of them are meeting online or with a hybrid of the two. We would love to help plug you in. You can find that information in the chat or in the video descriptions, wherever you're joining us. But church, I pray that God would bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, lift up his shalom, shalom, his perfect peace upon you and give you his peace. God bless you, church, and we'll see you this week online.